So what, one of the major issues, I guess, we have in a lot of the developing world when we think about climate change um, is that it seems a long way away geographically. You know, we might see uh, a hurricane or a drought overseas, um, and it's hard to relate that to, to, to us and, and why mm -hmm. we should be worrying about climate change. There's also an issue about it being into the future, and, and again, you know, um, it not really affecting us directly. So for the first one in terms of the, the bringing it home, why yeah. climate change matters to me in Scotland, which is often cold, you know, sure do I want it to get warmer, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and climate change is a positive. Actually, one of the key messages there is, is the globalisation or the global view of uh, who we are as human beings. So if we think about a climate change impact like a big flood in Bangladesh, we know that those events are likely to become more frequent with climate change. And that has an impact on us indirectly through um, migration pressures and political instability in the region. Mm -hmm. But it also has major impacts on us as individuals, even though we're living in a, what seems like a, a well-off country here, in terms of things like um, global commodity prices. So we'll end up paying more at the shop for our loaf of bread because the wheat crop's been lost in another country the other side of the world. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the, the beauty of the world now is we're so well in, interconnected. You know, you can, you can talk to people on the other side of the world at a click of a button on your computer. Mm -hmm. um, but as part of that, we're kind of more codependent than we've ever been. So a very severe impact in one part of the world has ripples right around the world. So none of us can kind of sit in an ivory tower and say, mm -hmm. you know, we're okay. Actually, the repercussions of climate change um, are, are felt globally. We have this global commons, which is the atmosphere, mm -hmm. and that's where climate operates. And actually, in terms of our, our economic systems, mm -hmm. um, our, our kind of transboundary movements of people, so migration, um, all of these are interlinked with environmental impacts. And so it kind of comes home to roost. If you're a, mm -hmm. a nation, for instance, which thinks, OK, climate change is going to affect um, a lot of these other countries very negatively, mm -hmm. but we're OK at the moment. We're going to see uh, warmer uh, temperatures and our crops will grow better. So why should we worry? Actually, what they will see if they take that route mm -hmm. is they become more and more vulnerable through these linkages that we share through trade and through migration mm -hmm. to the impacts of climate change. So we really are all in this together. Mm -hmm. And so th thinking then about responsibility and where responsibility lies and perhaps trying not to feel overwhelmed by the challenges that we face, mm -hmm. what would you say about responsibility and the sharing of that? Yeah, so that's, that's been a really interesting question uh, in terms of who bears responsibility for the climate change we're seeing and then who should act upon it. So at an international level, this has been a key to negotiations, is this frame which, um, phrase which is common but differentiated responsibilities from nations. So we know that the, the most severe impacts of climate change are likely to occur in the nations least responsible for the emissions. Mm -hmm. uh, so in um, sub-Saharan Africa being a perfect example where um, rainfall is, is very much at risk, um, very severe impacts in terms of drought and, and uh, uh, other impacts there, but the emissions are tiny. They, don't, mm -hmm. they aren't responsible for uh, the emissions that uh, are causing this. So there we have the question about who's responsible for tackling it. Mm -hmm. And at an international level, it's actually been quite a block in terms mm -hmm. of getting, getting movement as a planet, as a global society, to tackle climate change. Because some of the rich countries have said, well, you know, if we're going to just act unilaterally or multilateral for, for rich countries mm -hmm. in cutting our emissions, um, surely that's going to cost us jobs and cost us economic mm -hmm. growth and let you developing countries develop even faster. Um, and so we want some quid pro quo. We want you to have limits on your emissions as well as us. Mm -hmm. So that's where a lot of the arguments are, is, 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 is over how that responsibility is shared. Mm -hmm. I think one of the, the other big issues of responsibility is this generational issue. Yeah. That if we think about climate change and the, the, the most severe impacts, it's going to be um, as the century progresses and the second half of the 21st century is where we expect mm -hmm. the most warming to have occurred and so the impacts to occur from that. And a lot of us won't be around then. Mm -hmm. uh, it's our children our, and our grandchildren who will be experiencing those impacts. Mm -hmm. And so the responsibility there is, you could argue, um, a bit opaque in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, do we essentially let them deal with it mm -hmm. um, and hopefully make the world richer now so they're more able to deal with it in the future? Or do we really 
focus on cutting emissions today so that they don't have as severe climate change. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the crux of the economic arguments is, or one of the major debates, mm -hmm. is is it better just to lift, pe lift people out of poverty now and make people richer at mm -hmm. the cost of more emissions now so that they're better able to deal mm -hmm. with climate change impacts mm -hmm. in the next half of the century? Or is it better to tackle emissions now or write it be expensive to make sure the impacts are less uh, mm -hmm. in the second half of the century. Mm -hmm. And the seminal report on this was the Stern Review in 2008, and it's been updated last year, mm -hmm. which looked at this and said, OK, how much is it going to cost us to tackle climate change, avoid mm -hmm. dangerous climate change today? Mm -hmm. And if we don't, how much will it cost in the future? Mm -hmm. And Stern's analysis was, was seminal, really, because it put into numbers what we all kind of knew about sustainability, is that if we tackle climate change today, it will be expensive. One or two percent of global um, uh, domestic product. So basically, all the money we make, you know, two percent of it going into tackling emissions, cutting emissions. But if we don't cut it, if we spend the money today on um, other things and say, okay, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll we'll deal with it tomorrow, we'll mm -hmm. deal with it in the second half of the century, then it will be costing us uh, up to twenty percent of global uh, output. Mm -hmm. So we're storing up a real a real big bill for mm -hmm. our children and our grandchildren. So in terms of that responsibility, then it puts a number on it and says, OK, you know, in terms of responsibility for um, our kids and our grandkids being quite rightly really angry with us, mm -hmm. uh, we've got a responsibility to act now in cutting emissions um, mm -hmm. and increasing resilience, increasing our ability of communities around the world to be prepared for the impacts of climate change and to reduce how big mm -hmm. those impacts are going to be. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thinking intergenerationally then, so thinking about our relationships now with one another and in communities and coming back to trying to find a personal response to this and thinking locally as well, mm. what would you suggest or could you give some advice or ideas or examples of ways in which we can start to find a response to that now? That yeah, challenge? yeah, so, so it's, um, it's really hackney, but it's, <laughs> it's know your audience. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess that applies for any, any area of communication and climate change is no different, any area of action. Mm -hmm. So one of the, the lessons, certainly for me over the years, has been that talking about climate change is this looming catastrophe mm -hmm. um, and kind of using this, this narrative of fear mm -hmm. um, certainly doesn't work uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, it's, it's something which is um, not really based backed up by the science. Yes, we could have catastrophic climate change, but mm -hmm. that's not guaranteed. Actually, we have a choice, as I was mm -hmm. saying earlier. Uh, but also in terms of um, how people react to messages and how people behave, mm -hmm. really you need something which is a bit more segmented, a bit more um, dynamic. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking to someone about why climate change is important to them, it might be that their, their best thing in the world are polar bears. And mm -hmm. So you might talk about yeah, the vulnerability of Arctic systems and polar bears. That might be something which really resonates for them, mm -hmm. uh, helps them to understand what climate change is and also uh, uh, promotes kind of action and, and more learning from them. Mm -hmm. But for other people, it might be human health. There's a huge link there between um, human health threats and risks mm -hmm. uh, and climate change. So it might be the human health angle is something which is uh, more applicable to your mm -hmm. audience. I think in terms of then getting the action, this mm -hmm. segmented approach is even more important because you mm -hmm. have, you have um, communities who might be worried about climate change, they might mm -hmm. want to do their bit, mm -hmm. but uh, as individuals and communities, what they're willing to do um, can be uh, across a whole spectrum. Mm -hmm. So if you go straight in and say, we need this massive cut in emissions, and so what you need to do is not drive ever again, mm -hmm. is turn off all the lights and sit in mm -hmm. a dark cave and eat berries, mm -hmm. then you might get a couple, I mm -hmm. guess, who go for that. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's unlikely to actually get buy-in and, um, and get real emission cuts from, from, um, from individuals. Mm -hmm. I think if you then instead go in and say, OK, there are quite a few things we can do in our lifestyles that will, will help in terms of cutting emissions. And, and every tonne of carbon... Mm -hmm carbon emissions really count. Mm -hmm. um, there are things we can do which are, I guess, look relatively small. Things mm -hmm. like uh, recycling is an example. It doesn't have a, a huge carbon benefit, but it's a little step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And what you can find is if you, if you get communities engaged with um, 
recycling, then that can lead to composting of organic waste in the kitchen. So it can lead to a little bit more activity. And then uh, providing information and saying, saying, okay, another thing you could do is uh, looking at your energy efficiency in your home. Um, mm -hmm. These are simple ways in terms of um, term turning the thermostat down a little bit, looking mm -hmm. at standby power and turning that off. Again, incremental things which will actually save money and are, um, are, are around the edges in terms of behaviours, mm -hmm. but all a part of the spectrum of moving to a lower carbon lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I guess one of the, the really nice ways um, that this has been shown is where in carbon calculators have been around mm -hmm. for a while, where individuals, you can put in your information and it'll show you how much carbon you'll cut. Um, and that, that's kind of, that's nice. And you can say, mm -hmm. oh, I've, I've cut a ton of carbon. But one of the nice things that's moved to is actually representing what that means in terms of the climate and how much mm -hmm. benefit uh, that can gain. So one of the, the things we're facing with climate change is the more carbon dioxide we put into the atmosphere, the more warming we get. Mm -hmm. But if you think about your actions and you do something like um, cut a ton of carbon over mm -hmm. a year by something like using the bus once a week would achieve that for most people. That ton of carbon, instead of being emitted to the atmosphere, isn't emitted. Mm -hmm. And in terms of what's driving climate change, the more carbon dioxide, that's a ton of carbon which now isn't trapping heat radiation and isn't warming the planet. Mm -hmm. And so they start adding up. Mm -hmm. So you start mm -hmm. as an individual, as soon as you cut that ton of carbon, you're having a positive impact in terms of avoiding dangerous climate change. And if you start adding those up over communities, then you start seeing how powerful we are, how actually um, mm -hmm. these these kind of bits of carbon here and there, which would have been emitted, which aren't anymore, mm -hmm. actually are giving us a different pathway. If we think about that pathway into the future, mm -hmm. and the four or five degrees of warming, our ton is slightly changing that pathway. And every ton after that, that we reduce, is moving us towards essentially a safer climate future. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's part of that narrative, I think. In terms of the segmented approaches, you'll have, you'll have individuals and communities who really are zero movers. You mm -hmm. can give them all the information you like and their response will be um, uh, not to do anything. Mm -hmm. you know, it will be one of um, either the climate science is too uncertain or mm -hmm. you know, why should I act? It's down to the politicians or to other mm -hmm. nations. Mm -hmm. And then you'll have on the other end of the spectrum people already doing loads and are really kind of carbon conscious and, and environmentally conscious. But most people between those, those kind of extremes and so it's thinking about your communication strategy to say, what's, what are these people already doing? How would they fit this into their busy lives? How would they kind of really engage with it? What, what is the nudge effect? You know, what kind of things um, are important to them and, and what kind of things would make it easier? Mm -hmm. So a lot, of, a lot of the improved communication has been about that, has been, has been talking to schools, for instance, about... Okay, for climate change for you schools, um, how would it best fit in the curriculum in terms of what the kids are, are learning about and, and, and learning about sustainability more broadly? Uh, as schools, what can you do in terms of eco groups and your own performance in terms of energy use and how can the kids be involved with that? So, what works for you? For a hospital, you know, their hospitals are hotspots of energy use because you need to keep people warm, you need to keep a lot of machines running. So working on that basis with the realities of running institutions like that, how can they um, be helped to become lower carbon and become more energy um, efficient? So it's, it, it really is hackneyed, but it really is true. Knowing your audience really is, is the key to then getting the right message to them and then seeing uh, action on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so from your experience then of 20 years of working in this field, and and seeing some of these changes in the, the reports and uh, the responsibility, the change in responsibility as well, and the, the finding that personal connection within uh, these bigger challenges. What's your thoughts for the future and your thoughts on how you see this going forward and a move towards action? So I think, I think where we're headed in the future is is more of the same. We've got difficult choices to make. We've always mm -hmm. got that balance between short-term growth, you know, um, creating jobs. The politicians want more and more jobs always, mm -hmm. and to cut taxes and to um, and to not rock the boat too much. 
Um, and we've always got that, that challenge of, of short-termism, I guess, in policy compared mm-hmm. to climate, which is a 30-year you know, average in climate changes mm-hmm. that we're, seeing or, we're talking about or over a century. So there's always that slight disconnect. But I think um, the trajectory where we're moving on is one where, as individuals, as, an, a popula- as a population, we demand more action and we're doing mm-hmm. more ourselves. Mm-hmm. That feeds through into the politicians then having a mandate to put in the carbon targets and for um, international uh, actions actually to be more and more far-reaching. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's almost a, um, it's funny, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of in tandem race. We've got mm-hmm. climate change happening and mm-hmm. the impacts will get more severe. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, we're doing better and better uh, in many parts of the world in terms of cutting emissions. And the faster we do the cutting emissions one, mm-hmm. the less we'll see the impacts. So there's that, that constant race between the two. If we start failing on emissions, then we get the worse impacts. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the, the overall view has to be one of a lot more to do, seriously a lot more to do, some real big challenges in terms of how we decarbonise our energy system, for instance, while still keeping the lights on mm-hmm. around the world. But we have the technologies, we have um, some good success stories already. So mm-hmm. I really think we, we can do it. We can do, we can end up the climate for our grandkids where they'll still be quite cross with us, <laughs> but not as cross as they would be had we not been taking the action with it.